business as unusual. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but wanted to give you a little housekeeping update. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to add them to the chat, and I will try to get to all of them during today's session. This is a really, really meaty topic, so you know, encourage you to add your questions in as early as possible. So I am Kathy Steele, and I'm the CEO of Red Caffeine, and I'm your host today. If you haven't heard of us before, if you're unfamiliar with Red Caffeine, we're a growth consultancy, and it's our mission to build badass brands that people want to work for and with. And today we're going to stop, uh, talk about a topic that's been stealing a lot of limelight recently, artificial intelligence. So AI isn't exactly really a newcomer to customer experience or marketing. We're all familiar with tools like Siri and Alexa and you know, some voice assistants or customer service chatbots that we've been seeing have been using um, AI technology for a long time. But the buzz these days is really about how AI can be a game changer in shaping customer experience, service, and marketing. We're talking about, you know, the real kind of the new ability to craft convincingly real content in a flash. Um, we're just getting the grips on the colossal impact and potential of generative AI. And, at, and, you know, just this morning, I was looking at something that had been generated by AI um, kind of roll up a quick concept. So it's really fascinating how much it's integrating into our day to day uh, already. But all good things um, do have their downsides. Uh, we really can't turn a blind eye to it if we start putting all our trust in AI generated content without some human oversight. We risk inaccuracies, spreading misinformation and even having some really strange interaction. I'm sure some people have heard about the chatbot that fell in love with the New York Times reporter. That was a pretty funny story. Uh, but just a few weeks ago, more than 350 execs, data scientists, and AI signed this open letter released by the Center for AI Safety, um, a nonprofit organization, and it's stating that mitigating the risks of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. So there's a lot of, you know, I don't know how you feel about this, Alana, but there's a lot of, you know, negative um, content out there about AI as well, you know, putting some scary predictions about making sure we're really good stewards of how we're using these new technologies. But today, as I mentioned, I want to introduce you to our our guest, her name is Alana Widas, and she's a senior partner and digital commerce practice leader at Tata Consultancy. Quite a mouthful, your title is long, but because you're you're such a um, you know uh, expert in the field, she brings extensive knowledge and expertise in D 2 C, B 2 B, and B 2 B 2 C commerce with a passion for driving growth and enhancing customer engagement. Um, while increasing profitability through digital platforms. She's known by her colleagues, colleagues as the dot connector. We love that. We always say that's like the secret ingredient for our employees too. And so a lot of specializes in building processes and structures to solve business problems around speed to market, content creation, pricing, and supply chain visibility to drive customer adoption. So we're so pleased to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, and I, I always like to ask like a little bit of a warm up question. You know, we've sure. introduced your bio, it's on all of our marketing materials, but is there something that's not on your bio that you can share with our, our guests today? Sure, I mean, I think uh, probably just my love for all things uh, digital and commerce and um, the, the whole end to end process and how customers, whether it, the lines blurring, you know, it all comes back to the customer experience. And I find that fascinating and, and how that continues to evolve. So the, the lines between really even consumer and customer. So think of us as like consumers and consumers or customers in a business to business setting. Um, my eye, eye opening, just the, how much that the worlds are blending and, and really how much each side of the coin, if you will, is really borrowing and learning from the other in ways that I don't think people necessarily are always um, 
aware of. And as I continue to learn and be exposed to that, it just makes me love the field that much more. So I yeah, it's, geek it's, out on that stuff. But <laughs> it's so incredible. I think, you know, especially if your your business is focused on, you know, really building that true relationship with your customer, if there's an ability to add this personal experience or really meet their na- needs in a way that you can't really scale with you know, humans alone, I think the potential is really incredible to add automation and, and some, you know, some new experiences without suffering, um, being, you know, a high touch, uh, experience as well. So really excited to dig in today. Yeah. So I want to kind of start at the very like high level by you know having you first, like walk us through just defining the difference between, AI. There's a lot of terms, you know, out there, large language models, generative AI, AI. Can you just sort of set the table with giving us some framework about sure. what it means? Totally. And I think you, you touched on this um, as part of your intro, Kathy, but AI is not new, right? I mean, there's Alexa, there's Siri, there have been algorithms, um, mathematical equations, um, in, in the retail world, for example, for ages. So as, as, as long as um, commerce, e- digital commerce, e-commerce has been around and the notion of um, product recommendations or what served up to you, like early personalization, like we saw you looking at this and you might also like that, right? right. Those are all, <laughs> all early versions of um, AI. I think the big kind of shift has been um, to this concept of generative AI, which is um, now uh, smarter for for lack of a better term and more trying to imitate and replicate the way like our brains work and take in so much data and process it. So when you think about like chat GPT um, and things that are more now content generating in a way that um, that our brains might think of things that's that's what's new and that's where the big shift has been um and and i think that's where some of that negative press that you were talking about also is coming into play because if we can have chat gpt write a proposal for us or write a speech for a wedding right <laughs> exactly <laughs> where do we where do we come in um and and the the llm the large language models is part of that generative um um, AI component, but it's the, it's a, um, type of artificial intelligence algorithm that is that deep learning techniques and, um, takes huge data sets to understand and predict, but it's getting smarter, right? So old school algorithms were supposed to get smarter with more data. And this is just taking it to the, to the next level. Yeah. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of time saving, but not actual human, uh, you know, out of the equation, you still you still need to review things and fact check and, and, and stuff like that. But it's definitely uh, allowing us to do more analysis versus spend time on on some research aspects that we would have had to do way more manually in the past. But when we're yeah. talking about customer experience, you know, specifically, you mentioned you know um, chatbots. But what what are some of the other ways that you're seeing like? the use cases for AI and and just customer experience per se? Sure, so um, whether at work or in general, like how I think of things is the full customer journey or commerce value chain, if you will. So everything from driving traffic through through to uh, purchasing and post order support. So when we think of marketing and um, I don't know if Parker is um, able to flash up the, the first slide there. Um, Yeah. And and we'll talk a little bit more about the why as well, because I think that's an important thing. But um, when you think of marketing sales and service or driving traffic to the making the purchase decision to post order support or post purchase support, you're seeing AI creep up in each of those steps in different ways. I think the most prevalent and most visible to all of us right now is that chat bot. Um, so from a customer support, um, inquiries, they're, you know, trying to, um, uh, answer questions so that you don't have to wait for, to speak to a live person. Um, 
there is some that are further up in the apparel space that I've seen further upstream, if you will, um, around I'll call it clientele and helping with product, like picking out outfits and product recommendations um, in the apparel space, um, content creation we've talked about in the marketing realm, um, and then getting into even uh, customer segmentation um, and, and data analysis. So um, I think what I want to call out here is uh, the importance when you think about using AI and understanding why. And one of the, the big things that um, for the group here today is, is understanding the why you want to use it and then go from there because um, it is a very talked about subject and can you know be the shiny object but understanding how it ties back to the customer journey the customer experience that you're wanting to deliver and wanting for your customers is is of utmost important i think that can drive how you best use ai for your organization yeah so uh you talked a little bit about um kind of client telling now is that where people are actually able to kind of try on clothing i i just i i've never heard of that term oh yeah yeah sure i mean client telling um uh is i'd say um uh about uh giving more in an omni-channel setting but can be you know in a business to business setting equally as well bridging okay. the gap bridging the gap between um, a customer interacting with a digital platform and tying them tying to um, a live person. So in in a retail setting, it was initially come up with how do we give store associates or in, in a B2B setting, your sales reps, a way to still interact with the customers and provide recommendations and per, a personalized experience, but um, leveraging digital channels. So you might have um, a way to push products to them or send recommendations. Um, it could be, you know, Nordstrom does a my boards um, that you can, your salesperson can put an outfit together for you and you can um, and just shop from there, right? But then the salesperson still gets the credit. And I think about in a B2B setting, um, which I, I believe most of the audience <laughs> here today will be, um, and going back to the why we're using AI, it's, it's, trying to solve some key business challenges, maybe around cost to serve, right? Where um, when you better understand your customer segments um, and want to maybe um, reduce cost to serve for some of your lower volume, lower profitable, less profitable clients, right? You might start shifting to more of a digital model. Um, the customer segmentation, of course, and understanding how you want to do that segmentation or even augmenting or shifting the role of um, your customer support staff or your sales staff so that they can become more consultative and less of order takers, right? right. So right. Less all of these are kind of going, in, yes, less reactionary and more of let's grow the size of the pie. And so, um, and so I think all of these are challenges and business questions, uh, opportunities, if you will, that folks are trying to solve and then how to, you can leverage AI for any of or all of those at different points is uh, where the fun comes into play. Yeah, and I, I mean, I love that you start with why because I think, you know, with anything, you're, you know, you if you just start building without really understanding what you're trying to get, you're not, you're not aligned on the outcomes you're really looking for. So, talk a little bit about some of the, you know, we mentioned a few things, but what are some of the most widely used? technologies in um, customer experience and marketing and, and why are they? Sure. I mean, so, um, you know, the big guys in the playing field, Adobe, Salesforce, they're all using um, some form of AI and their products. Um, Adobe Sensei, for example, um, or there's a new generative AI powered uh, Firefly, there's Salesforce Einstein, just thinking here, um, you know, a newly announced AI, AI oh, sorry, cloud service um, for marketers to enact and enable things like next best action or building personas. Um, those are what the, the big guys are trying to incorporate into um, their platforms and offerings today. Yeah. Um, uh, 
but powering those from a CX perspective, um, powering the journeys, powering the personas um, through digital experience platforms and such. Yeah, I was really, I, you know, I actually, we, we did a session just a few, uh, just last month on buyer yeah. personas, and I was super interested in how, you know, that, you know, how well those buyer persona technologies are performing. Have you had an opportunity to leverage, you know, are, are you feeling like they're, they've come up with some pretty accurate results? You know, I, I personally actually, to, to be transparent, have not. Okay. Um, again, I think these are, are newer to to the market. Um, and so, uh, you know, everybody, um, both on the supplier and the uh, integrator and the customer side, I think are still navigating and figuring out how to um, align the technology back to the why, right? And um, I think also to your earlier comment on, you know, there's that fine line of skipping ahead or, the, you know, harm versus help. <laughs> and um, you still want to do something that's going to be helpful to your organization or to moving your business or to building your customer journey um, or personas um, versus just skipping, skipping ahead. And I think there's still, we're still a little bit um, nascent in that in that understanding. No, and I think you and I talked a lot about it in the prep session. It feels like every day you, you like open an app and, and there's new AI embedded in it and you're just trying to figure out how does this really apply to my you know daily tasks or is it going to increase my productivity? But it's I, I still feel like everything is such a huge experiment. Of, you know, a real sandbox a, approach is likely best for right now because there's just so much you know, there's just so much for us all to learn. It feels like we've been drinking from a fire hose in the last maybe 12 months around this topic and, and how much accessible yeah. it's become. And I think accessibility is a great thing to point out um, because we're we're all, um, I think we've all interacted with chatbots, for example, in some way, shape or form. Um, and they can be great if you want a very standard answer, right? But once things start getting more complicated, and you feel like you're stuck in a loop of being asked the same questions, right, over and over again. Just <laughs> right? had that experience. Starts, right, so then it starts to become a negative right. customer experience as well. Or, you know, you get angry people who take to Twitter or other social media channels saying, you know, I couldn't get this answer or what's wrong with your customer service or I got the, you know, and so, um, and so I think it's exciting, but also, you know, thinking through the operating model, um, which I can talk a little bit more about later, but how you're going to um, enable your organization and still meet the needs of your customer are equally as important as having the ability through technology to do so. Right. I mean, I, we've still got, you know, a handful of clients that are like just newly leveraging CRM. So, I mean, it is, it's definitely a journey um, in how you're applying technology and then you know, uh, AI as well into those workflows. I think it's, it's, you kind of kind of meet somebody where they're at and then be able to just layer on things, um, you know, as you get used to using these, these tools and technologies. So yeah. I know the next slide you had a, like some examples, but you wanted to kind of talk through maybe a case study where it has improved customer experience and what were some of those success factors? Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, there was um, a, uh, and again, well, before I jump into the, the case study, um, just wanted to um, just, I guess, reinforce or reiterate shifting from a technology driven approach, which is I need to incorporate AI or I need to, I need to do this thing <laughs> because we need to have the latest and greatest and then fitting everything in your organization or picking your goals or um, operating model to fit the technology you've bought, um, as opposed to a customer experience driven approach, which is really aligning within your organization, again, on that customer journey, that North Star, what are the KPIs you're seeking, you know, wanting to improve or start capturing, and then selecting the technology that's going to best help you get there, because there is a lot on the market, right? Um, and I think it's all great, but it's not a one size fits all proposition. I always joke, right? I mean, when you go car shopping, somebody who lives in an urban area 
might need a different type of car than somebody who owns six cars and lives in a rural area or all of the different combinations and permutations. Um, and that can lead to very different types of decisions. Um, not just, you know, the newest your model or the fanciest or whatever it might be. Um, so <laughs> case study. Um, so we um, had an opportunity to work with a, um, a major telco um, to use um, digital twins, which is another use case for AI, to simulate customer perception and likelihood to move to um, different plans and different rates um, as, as an example and see um, what price, you know, elasticity and price sensitivity might be. Um, also, uh, we simulated customer journeys um, to track back to um, specific buying patterns and behaviors, find those um, abandonment points in the journey and try to prevent them um, and stem attrition from customers. So I think that was a really interesting and relevant uh, you know, use case um, that might not seem as obvious um, in terms of what people are thinking about with AI because we are just hearing about chatbots or chat GPT um, but more from uh, I'll call it behind the scenes data, customer segmentation, understanding the customer perspective. So in terms of like when you're automating marketing com communications, embedding AI to serve up the right or roll up a, an answer, is that kind of because I so when maybe just even stepping back to explain what you mean by a digital twin? Yeah, I mean, I think one way you could think a bit about it is um, in a in very, I don't want to say old school, but think of A-B testing, um, right. which anyone who's run a, so it, 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 I'd say it a, in a lot of ways, it's, a, it's an A-B testing environment or concept where you're, you're testing out, matching two, two scenarios, but seeing how they, one works differently. So I think that would be the best way to, um, and, and it's not just, you can do it for marketing. Um, it's always been very prevalent in um, supply chain for folks on the phone who work in the supply chain um, from a warehouse and logistics um, perspective, but that that's the concept of the digital twin. Okay. Got it. We did get a question. I think this is an interesting one. Do you think that there is a responsibility for companies to be transparent about when and where they're using AI? I, I, uh, he's referencing the um, Ryan Reynolds when they he used ChatGPT to write the Mint Mobile commercial earlier this year. That is a good question. Um... Hmm. <laughs> I'm stumped on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I you guess, know. I guess, yeah, my, my first thought is, is I don't. Um, at least at this stage, you're still, you, a person or a company or, or an employee of a company is still feeding the data, right? So um, it could be akin to, I have a team that I work with, if we're putting together thought leadership or proposals or even authors who might have a ghostwriter or someone helping them write, and they're providing the storyline, the story arc, the content, and someone's putting it together, you know, that's not always something that um, is said, I did all this. And, you know, you, you might give acknowledgement to your team, or you might say as a written by or, but I don't, I don't think that that it's much different of a of a con you know a concept, particularly if it's intellectual property coming from the person or the company. Right. No, I I would I would agree. I think we're you know you're seeing people showcase examples because it it feeds into the conversation and it really you know makes it more relevant there. And I think that was Ryan Reynolds' intent. I've seen it done by other marketers as well, kind of showcasing that they've used AI to write something and how accurate or inaccurate it is just to, to prove a point. Um, but I, I would agree if you're having something ghost written, you don't usually say I've, 
I didn't personally write this, but I'm going to take credit for it. it it's it, it's not, I, you know, and it's, I don't, and I think about it in the same way. We're not telling clients how we're making a, you know, a marketing automation journey, but we're talking about the touch points that the customer is going to experience through a, an automated sequence. So I, it would be just like stuff they probably don't really yeah, care about. Yeah, because I, I, I still feel, um, and this is not a business example, but a silly example, but I, I was playing around with chat GPT for my brother's wedding a couple of months ago, right? And so the, the prompts that I gave were very specific to my brother um, at the end of the day. So, I, you know, I would imagine if you and I both said, you know, had the task of writing a wedding, you know, sister of the groom speech, given our personal relationship with our family, with our, <laughs> with our brother and any other context that we were going to feed as those prompts, you'd come up with two very different speeches at the end of the day. So I think it's, it's again, that becoming more human like and incorporating that and um, augmenting or enhancing, but not, um, at least not at this stage, <laughs> thinking on its own. Yeah, I, well, I think it, I mean, one example of this, and we'll move on, but the yeah. we recently used um, AI to kind of generate um, uh, a just kind of some research. And so we, just like we would include any other, if we're quoting a, something from a McKinsey report, we would use our source. And so we, you know, conveyed that we used AI to do some of the research, but we were really responding with the insight on that research. So I, that was an, a use case that we talked about with the client, but wouldn't necessarily give every circumstance that we've used AI to generate something. Makes sense. So in terms of like kind of getting on to the next topic, what yeah. ways has AI been able to enhance other personalization and marketing and, and uh, customer interactions? Yeah, um, can, I'll, I'll go through a bunch. Stop me if there, I can't, I can't see the questions or if you want me to, if we want to land on one to talk more about. Um, but uh, I think right now it's, um, a new way for collecting and structuring customer interaction and engagement data today. Um, you know, that's because companies are collecting data. And I think um, you, you said, or I, I will re enhance that a lot of people are sitting on a lot of data that they don't know what to do with or how to use um, or don't have the right data um, necessarily. And so, um, using AI to help collect and, and structure that data um, could be a huge opportunity um, for future growth. Um, personalized experience, personalization, another term that's been around um, much like AI, but, um, but leveraging that based on past behaviors is key. Um, so today that happens in the, um, most often in very manual, process heavy ways um, through audience segmentation and journey orchestration, um, measurement of performance for optimization. Um, and uh, there's a lot of suggesting from current AI, but as it, as, as it continues to be more mature, I think that there's, um, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, to be smarter about what we know about past behavior and how to parlay that into um, that whole notion of per personalization. Um, do you want to stop? Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, I, no, a couple yeah. more examples would be great. I know things that come to yeah. mind for me, I, for, you know, we, I would love to see us being able to leverage AI and like lapse customer journeys where right now that, you know, if the data is in two separate systems, sometimes we're having to pull a list and, and then put a, you know, personalized journey together, but it would be incredible to be able to have that, you know, performed because yeah. it feels it's, like it's, it's a, not a good hum, use of human time to do those kinds of activities. Right. And I think that's that's a great point. So AI and machine learning, you know, it provides and will continue to provide the ability to go through a lot of data um, to form accurate pictures of what your customers are doing. Um, but much like the example of the wedding speech or however you want to say it, you have to know, and this goes back to the why and the what, right? What are the questions you're trying to answer? 
um, what do you want to measure um, before you get the data so that you know what you're collecting is going to put you on that right path, right? Or how to structure it. And I think, um, again, that's where you don't want to run off too fast and just go down the technology rope, but go back to what are, what are some key opportunities that I think are untapped, um, which AI could help you with as well, or what, what are you trying to answer and then leverage AI accordingly to help you get to deeper levels of understanding that you may not have been able to before. Um, the, the data that's collected around customer, anal, you know, customer interactions really can now be analyzed um, to detect what customers want and when, and you can personalize their journey um, based on desire and intent signals. Um, so it's, it's delivering what they want with less attrition, greater loyalty, lower response times, lower cost to serve, all of those things that, you know, help um, your P&L as well. But you need to really think about, again, tying it back to those KPIs and, and questions. And I can't really emphasize that enough because that's often a skipped over part. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that's, you know, some of the, the fear that's been posed to us from clients is, you know, really removing that high touch personalized um, response that they feel when they actually talk to somebody on their team. But there's a lot of low calorie activities that really don't warrant that high touch experience that could be, you know, could be done with a bot or, or you know, with AI. And it feels like being able to really think through all those different use cases and then start to put a plan together to automate what makes sense and, and you know, give more time to solution conversations um, and I with think, subject matter expert. I think it's also what are you missing or not capturing through human interaction? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we, we are all human um, or we might be in, you know, if we're in a call center or have just sort of a routine response or, you know, you get kind of into a rhythm of, okay, let me get you over to this department or here's my, here's my script, right? Then you almost forget to maybe note down those interesting data points that can further, that you can leverage to take a look back and say, where are the efficiencies or where are the enhancements or what pain points do we need to solve? So, um, you know, you're really solving you know, it could be two birds with one stone in the sense that you don't need <laughs> such a, you know, such a um, high cost way of responding to all customer inquiries. And at the same time, it allows you to capture data points and insights that you might lose just by nature of, you know, kind of being in a routine type of mindset. As, as a person doing that type of job. Exactly. I, we were just talking about this last week, presenting some buyer persona, you know, um, information uh, to, to a client. And, you know, it, it, does, it shouldn't just stop there. There should be some way of continuing to build on the insights about those personas and their, you know, preferences and their barriers to, um, to purchase and with, you know, with some type of automated tool that allows you to, you know, create those nuances and use cases that weren't really gathered in those first interviews without having to always go back and re-interview people. So I think there's there's just some great base um, cases that get can be developed and then built upon by, you know, having that additive part totally. of the process. So in terms of, you know, thinking about what's really kind of a hot button topic as we're, you know, in a more recessionary time, we want to be able to really make sure that we're um, managing a customer relationships and improving our, you know, uh, the loyalty we have with existing customers. So can you speak to, you know, some things that you're seeing in, in that realm, like around sure. customer loyalty and retention? Yeah. Um, so again, I think the next level of um, deep understanding, deep analysis, um, where past purchase behavior, um, abandonment, attrition um, behavior, um, you know, the AI, machine learning, however you want to call it, yields new ways to optimize um, loyalty and, and see things from different lenses. Um, I think as you were just sharing your last example, um, it also reminds me of, you know, uh, 
being in a meeting with a bunch of people and then debriefing afterwards and everyone heard something a little different or maybe picked up on <laughs> um, something that someone said that you may have missed, right? So um, AI, I think, provides a great way to capture all of those and bring them together. Um, and and so you were just talking and I was like, maybe that's a, a something that will resonate with folks. I, I totally love that because I've been, you know, trying to leverage it more for capturing meeting notes and like that to do list. And, and I agree. I, mean, I, I, I know it never happens in any meetings that I'm holding that people always are completely clear on what they're to do next. But, you know, for the rest of <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of the universe, I think that would be really useful. So we did get a, a really a, a great question from somebody in the, in one of our attendees. What are some of the business goals that are supported by AI? You know, it, it, at kind of the top level, I, they were asking, like, should we be setting things like freeing up resources, cost savings? Um, what, what are some of the other business goals that you, you know, you um, heard as you were planning on leveraging AI and some of the projects you guys are, are working on? Yeah, um, so for sure, and I think what we're seeing, again, that's what's most prevalent and, and visible right now um, is more in the, the realm of customer service. So I'd say things like cost to serve, um, better understanding, well, starting with customer segmentation, and that's where the journey and personas come in, which then in turn, allows you to evaluate where you can um, reduce costs to serve for um, those groups that are less profitable, um, but also identify uh, opportunity areas. So there might be a customer group that um, is untapped, right? That <laughs> could yield more profits that you might be overlooking or hadn't seen as a viable category before. Um, the as part of that concept of cost to serve is also the the role of um, your sales reps or your call center agents, etc. There's in all of these, I think there's both top line and bottom line opportunities um, to to right size, right? So it's um, you know for easy to answer questions that might not require that high touch um, hand holding, right? You send somebody to a chat bot and um, you know, if X percent of the time it answers their questions and you've freed up your agents or account reps to work on the more complicated ones. Likewise, um, uh, those folks can, sales reps can work on going after new accounts or growing an existing account and spending time in a more of a consultative, um, consultative role versus troubleshooting or order taking or tracking an item or anything along those lines. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not just a cost savings bottom line thing. I think there's a lot of upside opportunity as well, which shouldn't be overlooked. Yeah, I, I, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about like some of the sales data. What other things are you seeing um, use cases for in terms of you know, the sale process. Sure. Um, so uh, I think marketing campaigns would be another great uh, example. So um, in terms of optimizing and evaluating your marketing campaigns, there's journey, you know, using it for journey orchestration and optimization um, in the midst of a current campaign in progress to help increase performance. Um, so drive response rates or you know, whichever ROAS or ROI. Um, uh, again, using that digital twin um, uh, to simulate actual oh, actual customer performance. Sorry, my phone oh, went out for a minute. Um, you can test campaigns risk-free um, before fielding with actual customers. So I think that reduces your risk and enhances that you meet any um, KPIs that you've set out um, for particular campaigns, um, particularly if they're seasonal or for a new product. So you're really setting your, um, you can never promise anything or ensure anything. So I try and stay away from those words. But, right, right. But, but still, <laughs> you know, hedging still your bets, hedging yeah. and, and positioning yourself 
to optimize and capture, right, the best results possible, and and more importantly, to um, more easily and um, be agile in how you respond to what's working and not working. Which um, today in our world of you know you can change something on a website within within moments, right? <laughs> um, there's a uh, fast response time, that whole notion of speed to market and being quick to respond to what's happening is of utmost importance. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, 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 I just love the ability to be able to test and iterate more, um, you know, within a campaign versus waiting to, for six months to go by and really see a campaign of performance. There was another question. So I think this gets into integrating it into the customer experience um, because there is still a lot of fear around, you know, some kind of mishap or a chatbot um, gone gone wrong, a chatbot conversation. What are some of the things or best practices that um, organizations are putting in place to oversee um, these automation efforts or these AI efforts? Within. Yeah, actually, um, and if we could flip to the next slide, um, and uh, this doesn't uh, totally answer the question, but just to set it up, um, really understanding how to incorporate something like AI into your full organization um, so that you have the governance, that you have the right people and roles in the right places is really critical. Um, and, and so a lot of, often I work with my clients on defining their target operating model. Um, and that's, you know, if you say, how is your organization ready to enable AI? Um, part of that is to be able to handle <laughs> any issues that come up, just like uh, anybody that has any kind of digital portal, e-commerce platform you have the right people in places when something's out of stock or the site goes down or you sold you're selling something for 9.99 when it's supposed to be 9,099 right? have right <laughs> um and so you know within the operating model and usually look across seven dimensions the people and organization do you have the right skill sets folks who um the right roles and skill sets who understand ai and how it can impact the entire ecosystem of your organization. Um, have you defined processes, not only for um, setting up AI and enabling it for a marketing campaign or however you're gonna use it, but then um, to the to the question here, right? Um, who's, who's in charge when something goes wrong and what are the processes or steps um, to respond or to escalate, um, you know, along those lines? Um, of course, let me look at the technology um, piece, which we talked about earlier, and which which platform, which which um, technology is right for your organization, the governance, right? So how are you constantly taking a look, uh, not only at how you're responding to issues, but how you continue to leverage it or add features and enhancements or make sure that you're capturing the the benefits that you were set out to based on that customer experience or business goals, um, those KPIs, and then how you're delivering it, what, how are you pushing AI out to your customers and, and delivering that? So, um, so a little bit of a long-winded answer to the question, but um, more holistic in that um, I like to work with my customers to say like, it's not just how are you gonna respond when something goes wrong, but how are you setting yourself up, setting the foundation in your organization to really, to really be able to successfully implement and scale AI or really insert anything that you're trying to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember when, you know, marketing automation, the terminology came on, you know, the, the, the forefront. And I feel like so many people thought it was going to be like, I press a button and it's <laughs> automate all my marketing and it's going to be so right. super, simple and easy, but it really is about planning and, you know, planning for best case, worst case scenario and, and um, you know, just understanding, you know, the tools, technology, the people and the process that you're going to need to employ to, to, you know, to really have a good program in place. And it's it's a lot more complex than marketing automation terminology really le le leaves everyone to believe. So I'm glad you, you know, spoke to how, the, you know, the best case scenario gets set by, you know, a lot of upfront planning and and um 
and orchestrating before you're adding some of these complex technologies to your marketing campaigns or customer service response. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's it, that's really um, maybe not the most glamorous <laughs> part of it all. Not the part where we get to say we have the latest and greatest um, AI capabilities or AI platform, but um, you know it's it's at the risk of sounding a little cheesy it's it is the secret to to being successful at the end of the day is thinking through these foundational elements um so that everybody in the organization knows how you want to respond or at least has a framework for reacting or decision making um, otherwise you just kind of are off in all of these different directions Right. And I'm sure that you found, I, I know that we found that it, it's kind of a journey. We're layering on these enhancements, these tech enablement um, into uh, customer campaigns. They're not ready for everything that's possible. Typically, they, they need to be eased in to, uh, to using and leveraging these new tools. So I, I think it's just a, it's, you know, it's a constant journey. I love the idea of all the things that we're going to have at, at our hands, but you know, it's like, you can't, it's like getting dressed. You can't wear every piece of jewelry that you own. <laughs> so you probably shouldn't have your tech stack use every, you know, option that's out right. there. Totally. So at, before I ask about what, you know, the future is going to bring you and look into the crystal ball, I did want to ask, you know, the, the question that I think people are really concerned about it, how is it going to impact job loss? It, you know, people are very fearful that technology is going to take over their job. What, what's your thoughts on that? So kind of um, going back to this notion of the operating model and looking at it as growth opportunity. Um, I think it, I, well, well, first of all, I, I can totally understand and appreciate <laughs> that because, um, you know, if I am a somebody in a call center or an account manager and all of a sudden they're like, well, we're going to take this portion of your customers or this part of your job and, you know, leave it to um, AI or that person can now shop online and they don't, you know, they don't need you anymore. Like that would make, <laughs> certainly make me feel very uncomfortable. Um, Ideally, and, and thinking through these type of operating models, you know, you're considering how to then leverage your your folks, your associates, the talent that you have on hand more on the upside, right? So um, now that we've identified the customers that maybe aren't as profitable or don't require um, as much hand holding, right? You can go find. But let, let's focus on how we can help you find more of the ones that do, where maybe you'll earn more commission or, you know, can grow the size of your business. And then there's upside for you and the company and, and everyone's a winner. But I think that is something um, that you have to um, have alignment with, and within the organization and hopefully, you know, from leadership down, um, see AI as how can we um, take away the stuff where people are spending unnecessary time that's not helping us grow and shift to um, to a mindset of what activities and where can we um, be focusing on growth and then leverage those folks in the right roles to help be part of the, the growth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like as techs enabled us to do more with less, it is kind of that building process. It doesn't really eliminate your role. It eliminates maybe how you do certain tasks and you're able to do the, I think the thinking part a lot more yeah. versus the doing part when you're able to add technology into the equation. So, I mean, I, we've been through so many generations of fear over a job replacement by machines. And so I, I, I'm sure we will find a way to still be employable in 10 and 20 years from now. So, yeah, I mean, I think the, not a B2B case, but I think the, retail industry if you look at that is always a couple of steps ahead when it comes to emerging technologies and, and it, that certainly is an industry over the past you know even pre-covid <laughs> has gone through 
much of a renaissance, right? Um, you went from all in store to, you know, all of the D to C darlings to this concept of omni-channel to um, the insertion of clientele, which I was talking about earlier. So how do you still enable um, a, a store associate or, you know, someone to um, connect with the customer or consumer at different points in their journey or meet them where they're at, whether it's they're in the store or back home and want to complete a purchase later. Um, and so I think it's fair to say, you know, it's, I don't see a point where a physical store is going to go away. You know, it's a little bit of a swinging pendulum and we certainly went to the extreme D to C, you know, everything online for a little bit, but you start are starting to see this pendulum swing back the other way. And so at that, you know, those D to C companies are now setting up, you know, showrooms, if you will, um, so people can see physical product. And so if you do agree with the notion that retail is, you know, um, always maybe a first mover in a lot of ways and that the role of the physical associate or, you know, physical um, stylist or whatever you want to call it is still there. It's just kind of more, more yeah, and it's still, right. still right sizing. Then I think that is a good, you know, indicator that humans are not going to be entirely um, replaced. Right. And I, I think, you know, what you alluded to earlier is that the lines are so blurry. So I, even though retail um, experiences tend to lead the charge on where we're investing or what the people are expecting, those same kind of personalized experience in the B2B world, too. So how are we, you know, how are we taking what we're seeing happen in our own personal buying experiences and, and really trying to crack those same types of high touch experiences with our B2B customers. So and, and, and likewise, I, I think you and I were chatting about this in the prep session. I think people that that people are seeing all the day, all the time, because we all have our phones and now the customer expectations for best in class customer experience or the table stakes are that much higher. Right. right? If we can get this from Amazon, then we expect that from our doctor, or we expect that, you know, <laughs> right, from exactly. in a B2B setting. Um, but if you start digging in, I think there are some pretty cool examples of the reverse happening. Like um, you hear a lot now about buy now, pay later. So Affirm and Klarna and Afterpay, and that is really um, initially a B2B <laughs> concept. If you think about it, that's made its way to the B2C world. So. You know, not AI, but it's not a, you know, right. it's becoming more of a two-way street than, than just a one-way street. Definitely a blend. So before we, you know, get to the end of the hour, I wanted to give you a oh chance to just talk about fast. what what's happening. I know it, it goes so fast. What's going, what are we going to be looking forward um, to? What technologies are coming on the forefront or, you know, what other things should be expecting customer experience? Yeah, I mean, I do think um, we've talked a lot about um, customer service and I do see that, you know, the person to person customer service will continue to shrink, I guess, or be lower, um, you know, as particularly as AI becomes smarter and has those like neural mode nodes and such to, to be more human like, um, you know, and hopefully that will be more of a good thing for, for everybody. Um, and then, so I think that, and then I think the um, continuing to build and expand on the notion of the digital shelf um, and digital self, sorry, um, digital shelf has been around, digital self. So, um, uh, you know, the, the notion that, um, it would be someone who can review and evaluate and conduct digital transactions, um, maybe signing up for offers or proactively finding products um, that match your interests, um, having a digital shopper to buy your preferred products. I, I see that um, coming on. Um, uh, so um, the example I would give is like, if you imagine on Amazon, um, uh, as a prime member, if you will, um, you've got a version of your digital self that does everything for you. 
So you can give it different levels of autonomy to act on your behalf. Um, ultimately, you get to approve every action um, and you can set um, low level tasks or you know, your own business rules, if you will. Um, but you're allowing somebody to do a lot of that stuff for you and then only pull you in on um, what you consider, you know, bigger decisions or more sensitive transactions. So I think that will be an interesting um, advancement from um, an AI perspective. Oh, I love it. I, I'm in. Sign me up for the beta. <laughs> Have my digital right. self handle all the things I hate doing. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I know this, you know, we've only got a few minutes left. I wanted to give the a chance to let people know how they can reach out to you if they've got any yes, further questions. So feel thank you so much for joining us today, Alana. Thanks I really so appreciate yes. it. If, if you have any questions for Alana following today's session, please reach out to her and put business as unusual in um, the subject line so she knows that you know, she knows who it's coming from or where you, where you uh, saw this content, so she knows how to respond. Uh, really appreciated your time and joining us today. I want to tell Thanks everyone a little me. bit about our next guest that we're up, or our next few guests, but um, that will be uh, up at, for in July. It's two guests, John J J J Jankowski and Bob Lambert. And so what we're going to be talking about is really how to increase sales revenue in a recessionary climate. And so, you know, obviously there's a lot of still uncertainty around where this we're heading for the second half of the year. So we're going to be bringing two really great sales leaders uh, to the forefront, John from Sales Acceleration and Bob Lambert from Samurai Business Group. They're going to share their decades worth of wisdom regarding the most important changes CEOs, CFOs and other small and mid-market companies, executive distribute adding to their bottom line in the second half of the year. And so some of the things that we'll be sharing are ways to get your business development foundation in place so you're prepared to take advantage of these future headwinds and why, as I mentioned earlier, why your current customers are you know, super important. So making sure that you're taking care of them. Um, they are you know, the lower hanging fruit, as they say, in terms of, of, you know, getting more business or creating more enduring relationships. So don't forget about them as you focus on getting new like logos. And then how to really engage your team um, as, as selling as like more of a team sport. So it's not just the sales team's role that you're really embedding a sales culture across your organization. So really looking forward to having these guys on in uh, July. And if you go back, Parker, just to thank our sponsors, Insperity, HR Source, and M3 Learning, really appreciate their support of the Business as Unusual series. And then um, we've got one last question. Uh, how do you think uh, this will impact customers who prefer a face-to-face -face interaction? Do you think there should be an option given, given to choose, or could it be offered at a premium cost depending on the business? Got, this was such a hot button topic. I want to let let you answer that question if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, I think um, kind of also building on that retail industry answer. Um, I I don't think you can ever totally eliminate the a face to face or human connection because I, I don't think any of us um, as consumers right <laughs> um would would stand for that without being entirely frustrated um and so uh i don't think it's going to go away um people will always find a way to get a human or press zero um i think i do like the idea um actually um just like you can pick how quickly you want your package to arrive that if you don't want to sit and even wait <laughs> for um, to go through the prompts and see if you get the answer that you are willing, just like some people are willing to pay for overnight shipping or pay a prime membership to say, um, I want the ability to skip, skip the AI, skip the, that portion and take me straight to, to somebody. Um, and I think that's a win-win because that's a service somebody's willing to pay for and also helps offset the you know those costs for maintaining that service which um you know going back to why folks are looking to use ai to solve some challenges around cost to serve etc kind of makes it a win-win 
from that I, perspective. I, I think it's a, a brilliant idea as well. I mean, I think giving people a choice um, about the experience they want. Some people just do want to solve their problem in a more frictionless way online. And then other people have more complex questions that really need human interaction. So great marketing idea. So whoever yes. asked that question, thank you. That will be embedded into future client campaigns. Right. <laughs> Alana and Red Cat Bean customers. So right. thanks again for joining us today. We're at the end of the hour. Thanks to everybody that joined us online. We really appreciate your attendance and yes. keep the questions coming in. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.